We know that growing the healthiest pigs from the start determines success to the finish. After 65 years in the animal health industry, we understand your business. We have been and remain dedicated to animal health leadership, innovation, and research. For every pig, for every barn, for every customer, we continue to invest in innovation, solutions, and insights to help you achieve the full value from every decision. Get full value from start to finish with Alanco. So our last speaker of today is Dr. Daniel Anderson, and he's an associate professor in agriculture and biosystems engineering here at Iowa State. Um, his research and extension work aims to improve soil, water, and air quality by promoting the development and implementation of agricultural manure management systems that are environmentally sustainable, economically feasible, and socially acceptable. He uses extension programming, statewide training, and a mix of fundamental and applied research. I wrote that when I first started, and it was a fancy way to say, I get to think about crap a lot, right? <laughs> but I think it's a great job. Uh, I love it. And that's what we're going to try and do today. I'm going to try and ponder on what's happening in the world of manure, uh, the direction that we might be heading in, and some of the challenges that I think we face. So anytime I talk about manure, I like to start with fertility value. I mean, we live in Iowa, and it's one of the few places in the US where I think we actually use it as a fertilizer. Earlier today, I had a call with some people from Pennsylvania, and they were telling me about all the great changes they're making for manure. It turns out they're estimating that manure is about 20% available, right? So they take advantage of about 20% of the nitrogen in the manure that they're using. And I said, huh, in Iowa, we, if you are the most conservative you can be, we're probably using somewhere around 80% of our value. So props to us, I guess. We're way ahead of what some other states are doing, which is always nice. Uh, so when we talk about here, it's going to be a lot higher level than, than maybe where that was. Uh, and then at the end here, we're going to switch topics completely and try and talk about anaerobic digestion. Today, I will probably be the most pro-anaerobic digestion person in the crowd. The good news for you is when I hang out with people who really like anaerobic digestion, I'm the least pro-anaerobic digestion person in the crowd. So I hang out probably in that happy medium zone of, of reality. All right, we all know that uh, manure can be a resource. Certainly, if we don't manage it well, it can turn into a waste. And the thing to remember is, it doesn't just disappear, right? We are going to deal with it. How we manage it is extremely important to the people buying our pork products and the impact it has on water quality. You probably noticed that the last week was a high impact water quality week according to the Gazette over in Eastern Iowa. Today over lunch while we were eating barbecue, they had a webinar about all the evils of manure and how there's too much in Iowa. Good news, I think the panel was relatively uniform on their uh, description. They, they had pros and cons and talked about it realistically, but it is a high impact area and one that we're going to continue to have to talk about for the years to come. Manure value. Uh, this is a figure that I love to use because it shows how it's fluctuated with time. So if you go back to the early 2000s, manure value was about $10 per thousand gallons. Probably cost us somewhere around $15, $16 to get that manure out into our field applied. So we were losing money handling manure, right? And the way we thought about it, the way we talked about it, the way people said it smelled probably reflected that. Nowadays, when you hear people say manure is the smell of money, they mean it, right? When fertilizer prices went up, our barn designs changed. We got a lot better at water conservation. Uh, we're talking nutrient concentrations somewhere around 50, 60 pounds of nitrogen per thousand gallons now. And we look at what that means for fertilizer value. We're talking about over $30 per thousand gallons worth of potential value sitting in our pit. It still only costs us 15 to $16 to get it on. It's a money-making possibility for us, right? People want that manure. They want to utilize it on their farm. That's good for us, that's good for our business, and it's good for pork sustainability. Capturing that value gets complicated. I'd like to stand up here and say, we know what we're doing. I think we've made great progress. There's still challenges, right? The good news is now when we talk about those challenges, it's incremental improvement. It's not starting from scratch, thinking about it as a waste. We already have the right mindset where we're trying to capture more value and we want to do just a little bit better. All right. We still use yield goal on most of our manure plants. Somewhere around 95% of Iowa manure plants are filled out on yield goal. If you look at the Iowa DNR paperwork, they walk you through the yield goal method. I'm not here to say it's wrong. ISU has switched to MRTN. We switched to MRTN some, as our recommendation somewhere around 2005, 2010. So that's been our preferred method for a while. There's a few caveats for both, right? MR, yield goal is standardized. It reflects sort of a mass balance approach. I'm an engineer, I love mass balances, they have to work. We'll talk about maybe some of the struggles we have there, but, uh, and then MRTN is all based on spring fertilizer application. 
We all know that all the manure in Iowa goes on the spring, so that applies perfectly to us, right? We should just look at it and be able to make all our decisions based on that. So there's definitely some challenges, pros and cons to each. I wanted to talk a little bit about how the recommendations have changed, and we'll talk about why in just a second. But I have a couple of lines for you here. Uh, it looks like this blue dotted line. Oh, I suppose I have a laser pointer. I don't need to go point. But that blue line there, that's the yield goal method for the state of Iowa, our average yield, uh, and how it's changed for corn soybean, right? So proportionally, we all know yields have increased pretty consistently at about 1, 1 1.2 bushels per year per acre, right? We do better at growing corn. Great. Uh, continuous corn, same line, right? We're going up on the same trend. And man, those last few years, apparently we're really good on that trend line. Maybe we had a few bad years before that. And the MRTN, when you look at it, almost a flat line, right? So that recommendation hasn't changed. Yield goal has said it's going up pretty quickly. I want to do a partial budget. So where is that end going? Why might I have concerns? And the big one here is that back in 1990, when we, the, to the 2000s, when we developed yield goal, we said there was eight tenths of a pound of nitrogen in a bushel of corn, right? That was a rule you could go to the bank with. For every pound of corn you harvested, you were moving, removing eight tenths of a pound. Sounds good. Our yield factor for the yield goal method, based on that, right? We said for most of the state, it's 1.2. 75% of our nitrogen that we put on ends up in that corn ear, right where we want it. The geneticists, our nutritionists, like Brian said, I want more energy in my corn, right? Give me more energy in my corn. We started breeding corn that grows better, kernels, right? More starch in that kernel more energy, we didn't change the amount of nitrogen that it took up and put in the same kernel. All of a sudden today, we have less than six tenths of a pound of nitrogen in a bushel of corn. Our budgets have gotten a little sloppier, right? We're still saying it takes the same amount of nitrogen to make a bushel of corn. Our corn has a little less nitrogen in it, so maybe we're increasing our nitrogen rates quicker than what our corn is take, increasing its nitrogen uptake. That's not to say we aren't making more corn, we don't need more nitrogen, we certainly do, just maybe not quite as quickly as we were pointing out. Why does this matter? Water quality. This is a graph that I stole from Matt Helmers. All right, so it's his great work. He put a lot of effort into this. And they did a lot of plot studies where they did different application rates. I'd like to tell you that's manure. No dot on here represents any manure studies. This is all actually synthetic fertilizer, right? But it is available nitrogen that we're putting on. So when we think about using manure, we're going to think about available nitrogen. Whatever we choose to put on, the more we end up putting on, the more nitrogen we're going to tend to have in that tile line. Is it a perfect relationship? Absolutely not. Your soil matters, right? If you have good soil, grow really good corn, it's going to soak up more of that nitrogen. If we have maybe bad soils or a bad year where we have tons of leaching loss, we're probably going to lose a little more nitrogen. But our impact of different application rates impacts what the typical nitrogen concentration, at least on average, will be for that field. So if we put on more nitrogen, we're going to lose a little bit more in our tile lines. Now, the important part here is, for the most part, this line's pretty flat, right? As long as we're down here at that optimum rate where we're close to what our plants are taking up, we do a pretty good job. If we start to get really heavy, right, that's when we start to see losses. So as long as we're close to that economic optimum, we're in good shape. So our goal should be to try to be close to our economic optimum. Knowing that MRTN gives us that on average, but in any year, we could be off by 60, 80, 90 pounds of nitrogen for what the actual optimum rate is, right? If you look at MRTN, I didn't point it out, it says on average for corn soybean rotation, we're somewhere around 150. In any given year, that number is somewhere between 100 and 225 pounds. So I'm really good at giving you an average number, terrible at giving you what it might be in any given year. We have the same problem with manure, right? Manures are really variable. We deal with uncertainty, and we want to make sure we're trying to put on the right amount. I'm not an agronomist, so I'm not going to talk too much about that demand side. That what is what MRTN is supposed to tell us, knowing that we might have to look at adaptation in any given year to say, that corn isn't green, as green as it should, I should side dress some more. Hopefully we'll continue to develop better tests to do that for us. But what I do want to talk about is that supply side, because I think one of the reasons we end up putting on maybe higher rates of manure than what we'd maybe prefer is because sometimes that manure nitrogen just doesn't become available. Or maybe we don't get it injected really well and we volatilize a little more than we hope. Or maybe our equipment just doesn't do a very good job of getting it uniform. So I've been looking at some of the work that we've been doing to try and find out where the error in that manure application comes from. Which areas should we be focusing our effort on to improve equipment or decisions that we make? So in this one, I had data from six farms where we sampled the pits multiple times per pump out. So rather than just one sample and saying that was right, I was out there sampling at the top of the pit, 
again on our 20th load, again on our 40th load, again on our 100th load, and saying, how variable is it from sample to sample, right? Is that something that we should be chasing? For instance, that, does that mean we need real-time nutrient sensing technologies on our manure spreaders, like you might see from John Deere, Case, some other companies, and what value would that have for us? And the truth is, when I look at nitrogen, my average variation there from a single sample, if I'd use that, or if I had multiple samples, I'm off by like four pounds of nitrogen per thousand gallons. We do a pretty good job. On the other hand, probably not a surprise for anyone, if I go just take one sample from a manure storage and try and say, that's how much phosphorus is in my manure, I don't do very well, right? We know that if we don't get it agitated well, it's sludgy on the bottom, a lot more phosphorus, right? So maybe that sensing technology has some promise if you're trying to get phosphorus where you want it. For nitrogen, yeah, maybe it's worth chasing that four or five pounds per acre, maybe not. I'm going to skip that one. I tried to put this into value of what that sort of technology would be for you, right? If you did everything else perfect, we knew what the weather was going to be, I knew my yield response curve, how much value would real-time sensing add for me? It's related to the nitrogen content in your manure and how consistent it really is. For most of us, especially the swine finishing manure, we're somewhere in here. That sort of technology offers $4 an acre, maybe $5 an acre. Is that something you want to invest in? Maybe. Keep in mind it's a $30,000 piece of equipment. So if you're doing enough acres, you can probably afford to write it off. If you're not, it might be a harder one to pay for. We've gotten really good, right? We have crone flow meters on our tanks. We generally have Raven rate controllers, maybe something else. We think we have rate under control. How good are we really doing? This is some data where we've been applying manure up at the National Research Farm for quite a while. I put all that data together and said, how accurate can we be on hitting rate? We have one acre plots, so I should be able to do a pretty good, darn good job, right? If I say I want 3,000 gallons an acre, I'm only putting it on one acre. I'm not in a hurry like you guys because I only have to do 36 acres of manure total up there every year, right? So almost a whole 40, but pretty good, right? And if you look at what I did compared to what I wanted to be, I'm off by about four or five percent every year. Not bad, right? Of course, I don't have overlaps on the end of my field, but roughly where we are. So roughly as good as we can predict what the nitrogen content variation is going to be, right? So if I can't control rate better than my variability in manure, it's going to be hard to use that technology to do a better job hitting rate. Just to show you sort of where I am at putting manure on, my pre-samples at the Nashua farm sucked compared to what my actual nitrogen content of my manure was. Just for the record, I know I stand up at manure applicator training and tell everyone, if you pre-sample, it should be 90% of what your actual manure sample is. <sighs> I was off by like 40, 50%, pretty consistently at, at those farms. So manure isn't always friendly. Even if you name yourself Dr. Manure and, and act like you know what you're doing, you still have problems, right? <laughs> On the other hand, you can see, by the time we got to 2011 there, we got pretty good at guessing how wrong our pre-sample was going to be. It's not that our pre-samples got better. It's just that we said, we're going to correct it because that manure is always more concentrated than what our pre-sample says. In my defense, I didn't collect the manure samples for a pre-sample. Someone else collected them, and maybe we were dipping watery samples off the top. Okay. End volatilization, right? We say, here's our table of what you all should estimate for what's happening out in that field. Both of these are clearly injected manure, right? They ran injectors through the field. We have the same amount of end volatilization from both of those fields, right? That's what you think? Clearly not, right? If it's on the surface, we have a chance to lose nitrogen, but we say they're the same. So if you see an area in the field where it looked like this, and then later we come back and that corn's a little yellow, it wasn't that it wasn't available, right? We lost that nitrogen because, for whatever reason, that soil didn't take it in. Same thing with availability, right? We put up a table like this and say, pick your number from somewhere in that range. We know it varies from year to year, but we're going to say it's this on average. And then the last thing I did want to show you before I move on to what all this is worth and what I'm trying to talk about is, how do we compare with other states? Right? Because if we're going to give a recommendation, it turns out the border between us and Minnesota isn't some magic line. Despite the fact that they might cheer for gophers when everyone knows that cyclones are the best, uh, they basically have the same ground as us, the same weather conditions as our top counties, and you'd think the recommendations would be pretty similar. So Illinois is this, I don't know, lavender, let's say, color. And if you use yield goal in Iowa, we're right here. And it turns out for injection or incorporation, we're pretty much in line, right? We look pretty good. And then for some reason, if you go up into Minnesota and surface supply that manure, our recommendations are nothing like theirs. 
I don't know why. Actually, I do know why I looked at it, but they pick different volatilization numbers by a lot. On the other hand, if you cross the Mississippi into, uh, that was Illinois, sorry. Someone should have told me. I looked at my state wrong. Illinois was the lavender, so we were pretty close to Illinois. Uh, when you look at Minnesota, there, the yellow. The point being is, while the universities all have nice guidelines for us to use, if you look at different states, we aren't always in agreement. There has been some efforts to try and make some of our recommendations more uniform, but there's also a lot of effort going into why are they so different, right? We think we're managing swine relatively similar. We have the same equipment. The soils and climates are a little different, but what's causing that variability and how can we help everyone be more confident in what we're telling you when we can't even agree amongst ourselves of what it should be. The last one, uncertainty at least, that I like to think about is how much comes out of each knife, right? That distributor on the back of your toolbar is splitting it up perfectly, right? We never get a bone stuck in there. We never just have random equipment break down and fail where it's, there's a manifold plugged, so this shouldn't be a problem. On the other hand, even with clean water, when we're out testing some of these spreaders, you might see a picture that looks like this. Just see that, all the, oh, that I'm willing to get dirty. I'm the guy in the end, and I made my undergrad student stand in the middle where you might get really, really wet. <laughs> but you can see there's a pretty wide disparity of how uniform it is across that knife, right? And if we're going to trust that fer fertilizer value of the manure, we sure as heck hope that all our knives are getting roughly the same amount of nitrogen for that corn plant that we're putting it next to. There's a lot of variability between manifolds. This one is an older style, sort of crescent moon. There's some plates that you have to play around in there that are really finicky to set. I don't recommend it too much, but if you're getting up to high rates, and I'm going to call high rates something like 6,000 gallons an acre, it might work reasonably well for you. On the other hand, if our manure is getting more and more concentrated, and you only get to put on 3,000 gallons an acre, yeah, it didn't work very well, right? We might have one that's flowing like the Niagara Falls, and one that's flowing maybe like the Raccoon River this year while we were in the midst of a drought. Different style manifold, hydraulic pump on the top, some knives in there that spin around, hopefully cleaning off whatever's blocking the outlet, right? Also helping provide some pressure. It stays uniform pretty much across all flows, right? I have the 10% mark done there because that's roughly how good an anhydrous applicator is. If you're better than 10%, you're more uniform than an anhydrous application. We're probably doing good enough. Timing, trying to cl apply closer to in season generally is better. If you had a year like this where we we're really dry in the fall, really dry in the spring, we probably won't see as much difference this year in some of the studies we're doing on that as we have in the past when it's wet fall, wet spring, and more chance for nitrogen movement. All right, finally putting all that together, what does it really mean? When we tell you here's the MRTN curve, just pick the number on there and you're done, right? It doesn't take into account any of those variabilities. And the truth is, and every farmer intuitively knows this, you're better off to miss a little high than you are low when you pick a rate because nitrogen is cheaper than a loss of potential loss in corn yield. And this is trying to account for that. So when you think about the variabilities, the things you don't know as you're picking this out, how much volatilization am I really going to have this year? What's my availability for nitrogen this year? How good was my manure sample? Is it anywhere close to what it actually should be? How good am I going to hit rate? And when you start putting all that together, the actual maximum return to nitrogen is almost always going to be higher than what we tell you from MRTN. So we should be upping it just a little bit for manure. That's why we like the yield goal, right? Because while it might not be the best scientific method anymore, we haven't made adjustments, it still gives us a number that is more accurate than MRTN, given some of the uncertainties that we have to deal with. So somewhere around 20, 25 pounds of nitrogen higher for spring application compared to MRTN is what it looks to be like that uncertainty says our manure rate should be. The other thing that's sort of interesting to note when I do this modeling study, I get to pick up what my fall nitrogen loss is going to be. I said it was going to be 15 pounds. That's roughly what my Nashua data says it was going to be. To make up for that difference, I should pick a number like 22, 25 pounds of nitrogen extra that I want to add because I put it on in the fall instead of the spring. Because again, I'd rather be a little heavy for nitrogen for corn yield rather than the cost of what that nitrogen was. Certainly, I have unaccounted for costs in there. Like, what's the impact on water quality? How do I value that? But trying to think about some of those nitrogen terms, what they really mean in picking application rates, hopefully that can help us start a conversation on it. The big one on there, I didn't point it out. That variability from knife to knife, getting good pieces of equipment there is one of the easiest ways to make this uncertainty go down, right? At least puts us in a narrower range on where we'd really fall on that curve. And that's an easy one to do at this point. 
most people are building a better piece of equipment that has some engineering behind those manifolds. If you still see someone who has a square manifold back there that they drilled some holes on, put some outlets on, probably time for an upgrade. All right, anaerobic digestion. If you aren't already getting calls about your pigs and someone wanting to put an anaerobic digester on your facility, there's a good chance that it is going to start happening to you. My first caveat up here, when I talk about this, I'm only going to talk about the economic benefits of what the energy you make is worth and D3 RINs. D3 RINs are a US federal government program that offer incentives for cellulosic ethanol and manure. The thing to keep in mind is most of the investment currently is driven by California and the low carbon fuel standard that they have set. The low carbon fuel standard pays us about five times as much as a D3 RIN. I'm gonna show you that people think they can make money with a D3 RIN. If you think about getting paid five times that, people get really excited really quick. Okay, we modeled four scenarios here. One is just a farm scale co-digestion. I wanted all these facilities to be bigger, so I'm gonna digest corn stover with my manure. Sorry, if you wanna do straight manure, that is probably what you'll get calls about because California doesn't know how they'd handle corn stover right now, but it still works out reasonably the same. Co-digestion with our corn stover, and I did that partially because we're right next to Vervio here in Nevada, and they're gonna digest corn stover like you wouldn't believe, right? The plant is somewhere around 180,000 tons a year. Scenario two, uh, I'm gonna start adding water. I really wouldn't add water. I'd recycle some of my manure liquid, but adding water was just easier for modeling. And apparently this is time telling me to talk faster, which is a rarity in my life. <laughs> Scenario three, I still couldn't hit economies of scale. I was doing that for a 4,800 head pig farm. So what is one typical swine farm in Iowa? I said, all right, still couldn't make it. What happens if we start thinking about community digesters? So the first one I said, rather than moving the manure around, I'd rather move the biogas around. And then the last one was, move the manure around, one big community digester, don't move the gas around. So there's scenario one, right? It's just one farm. And when I move to the community, it's five digesters. My G apparently moves to the bottom line. To put it on the pipeline, we do have to clean biogas. If you work with anyone who is doing these systems, make sure you pick a company that has some expertise on cleaning the biogas and getting it on the pipeline. That is the most complicated part of the system. It's where the most things can go wrong. And it's probably the part that you don't want to have to manage. Because you have to work with the utilities and it turns out they aren't happy when you put bad gas on their grid. You make some assumptions that go into this. I did pay for any manure I was moving around and I sold it back to you at nutrient value, right? So basically manure is net neutral in this, but I did make the anaerobic digestion company pay the moving manure around cost. Because if they're gonna take it from you, they should pay you for it while they have it. And they better pay to move it back to you because if they don't, why would you take it back, right? So I, the one caveat I have on this is I made all my farms really close to a biogas pipeline, right? I am within, should be up there somewhere, I can't find it. There we go, manure transport difference. All my farms are within two and a half miles and I made sure that everyone was within a half mile of a biogas pipeline. So I'm not in the middle of nowhere in Iowa, right? I said, I'm gonna sit right next to a pipeline because I have to put it on a pipeline. So just because it works for me, doesn't mean that if you aren't sitting anywhere near a pipeline, you can do the same thing. Hooking up to the pipeline costs about a million dollars and it's about a million dollars for every mile you have to go. Natural gas sometimes is worth decent money. Uh, we average about 50 cents a therm. It fluctuates a lot, right? So if you want consistency in what you're making, what you think your profit's going to be, natural gas isn't always a great market. <laughs> All right, I did do it with biomass. I tried to pick reasonable numbers for my biomass. There's pretty pictures on there, right, bailing it. I only let my solids content get to 12%. There are digestion companies out there that will tell you that they're happy to ha run 15 to 18% solids in their digester. Please don't believe them. Most of those plug up and then we have to clean them out and it's no fun. Everyone's unhappy. 12% is much closer to what we probably could really run through a digester. I'm gonna harvest about 70% of your corn stover that you're putting manure on, right? So I balance it to the amount of land you had available in all these situations, but I am harvesting a lot of corn stover. I'm only harvesting three tons of corn stover an acre, so you still have residue in your field. We did remove some. Hopefully that would make you do less tillage if I'm an optimist. If I'm a pessimist, I don't know what will happen with it. All right. 
man, my color doesn't quite show up there. White is a terrible color on this graph. It's supposed to be in green. OK, so scenario one here, where my costs went, you can see that there's a large investment in putting a digester in. Probably not a surprise, most digesters on a farm this size, somewhere around a million dollars, and I need another million to hook it up to my gas grid. Right? So I invested a lot of money. I can't make that one work. Even when I went to co-digestion, tried to make it to corn stover, still too expensive to make it work in Iowa, even with our good carbon credit of a D3 RIN. And the way you can tell it's too expensive is I'm paying about 433 there a gigajoule. And I should have read that one off my graph right there, right? So our 10-year average is 466, 463 a gigajoule. You have to beat that number, right, to be a cost competitive option. So I'm not too far away, right? I'm close. Moving it around, right, I'm about 1.6 when I moved my community digester, moving biogas around, which is interesting to me because I've seen lots of digester plans where they're moving biogas. So they know something I don't know, or my model is off about moving it around, or they don't actually have pipeline access and they're choosing to do this because they don't have pipeline access. On the other hand, when I get to my, my favorite one here, that community digester, it was cost effective, right? People think they can make money on that with a D3 RIN. That's why we have a big plant next to us. That's why I think we might start getting calls about it. The practicalities of this is most of the people who want to run a digester, good news, they know a lot about swine production. They understand how your systems work. Uh, they know how to handle biosecurity. That's not true, right? Most of them are biogas experts. They aren't swine production experts. So when they call you up, those are things that you will have to work out with them. So cost breakdowns of where everything was going. Uh, initial investment in capital cost is almost always the highest one. And that is why economies of scale get really nice. When you look at what I'm paying here, if I build a community digester where I move manure all to one site, I can drop my capital cost a lot. That is how we're getting towards cost feasibility. Now, that's only 20,000 pigs and all the corn stover that I'd grow from your manure, right? But it's not an unrealistic size. Comparing that to that 463 uh, scenario two there where I added enough corn stover, right? Moderately close, if we had a cheap way to get your biogas onto the grid, we're in pretty good shape. Otherwise, with all those carbon credits, my community digester there, right, I'm making 450 basically for every gigajoule that I put onto the grid. Good money, right? It's cheaper than what we're making for natural gas right now. D3 RINs aren't stable. Just like futuring corn, you can future RIN prices, right, so we can get some stability from it. The bad news is you have to sell them all the year they're produced, so you have to get someone who's going to sign that contract with you. And just like playing the commodity market for corn, people play the commodity market for RINs. Turns out people who are more invested in playing the RIN market tend to be big, and they can fluctuate the market right now on their own, and you're subject to following that fluctuation. If the price of RINs change by 10 cents, that may not sound like a lot. It costs you $1.23 per gigajoule because that D3 RIN is really important to me and how that actual profit works. Right, so the RINs really are what make this fly. I did want to point out our history of anaerobic digesters. Our Iowa is going to look exactly like this in the history, right? Currently we have four that are running and a boneyard of many, many anaerobic digesters that haven't made it. Uh, if you look more recently, starting in 2000, roughly 25% of the digesters that have been built post 2000 currently don't operate, right? Something goes wrong and they don't keep running. So, one thing to keep in mind, if you do start working on an anaerobic digester on your facility, it will be there, even if the company isn't there anymore to make it run, even if anyone isn't there to do uptake, it's still gonna be on your farm and you are still gonna see it. If I go back to the 1970s, which is the last time we had anaerobic digestion, the number of failures is upwards of 70% of those digesters are no longer running. So, and we did that because of the energy crisis in the 70s, right, electricity was gonna be worth something, we were gonna make good money on it, just like we're talking right now with natural gas and RINs. The take home here is, it is economically feasible, right? Companies can look at that and say, there is money to be made if I can manage it well, if I can build it well, and I can find good cooperators to work with. I know I get more and more calls every month about wanting digester companies wanting to work with swine producers. I'm sure you all are getting the same calls, wanting them, wanting them to work with you. But there are plenty of challenges. We keep saying technology will fix it. 
in the 70s. They would have shown that graph and said about 25% failed. In the 2000s, 25% failed. I'm going to go with, out on a limb here and say, we're still going to have failures, especially if that RIN credit or the low carbon fuel standard credits change. So California has it guaranteed for one more year. Then there's a legislative update on how they're going to pay those out, what that market would be. D3 RINs are, in theory, going to stick around, but it is a controlled market. The size of that market right now for D3 RINs, if 70% of the swine farms in Iowa would anaerobically digest their manure, <coughs> we've saturated that market. All right? So that's not the Midwest. That's not all swine farms. That's 70% of swine farms in Iowa, and we've already filled the D3 RIN market. So with that, happy to take any questions or thoughts on manure that you might want to talk about. Yeah. Before you went into the last section, there was a part that I didn't understand is the application rate and um, the slope. The variability from knife to knife of your manure applicator. Yeah. And if I see the variability across the bottom, it increases length to right. Yep, and then it stops and it gets worse, right? It starts to go down. Let me see if I can find it again. Yeah. When I first made that graph, I had the same problem as you did. Why the heck would it look like that? All right, so this is the graph that we're talking about right here. And this is knife to knife variability. So a good distributor is somewhere around 10% right there, right? We're really pretty uniform. And 100% basically means one knife gets no flow, the knife next to it gets twice as much flow. All right, that's one way to think about it. So when you start thinking about that, let's start on that extreme and why it doesn't work. Well, that means one corn row, I'm not fertilizing, and when I'm putting twice as much fertilizer on as I could. And one response people could have would say, well, I know how to fix that. I'll just put on more nitrogen, right? I'll up my rate. Well, now this one's still got zero, and this one got 220% of what it needed, and we still didn't improve this one's yield, and we just wasted a little more. And if you think about that scenario, even as you back off, the same sort of thing is happening, right? One row gets more nitrogen, and putting more on doesn't help me with that. It makes it worse. Putting less nitrogen on actually means this row still doesn't get as much as it needs, but I save a little on fertility. So that's what's happening there. The good news is most equipment right now here are better in terms of knife-to-knife -knife variability. But that's what's happening. And we tend to have most of the equipment out there right now, I think, tends to fall right here. The newer equipment, we're falling over here. So if you bought equipment in the last five years, you should be in this range. If it's older than that, we're closer to 30%, 40% knife-to-knife variability. And that doesn't account for variability of something plugging a manifold, right? If you have a bone that gets stuck in there, if you have a chunk of 2 by 4 that gets stuck in there. If you have a rock that gets stuck in there, that can throw it all the way off. To me, you answered it, but it still throws me off that 70% variability is the same return to nitrogen as 0% variability. Yeah. <laughs> I, I this, is zero, this is 0 this is 0% variation, right? Variation, yes. From knife to knife. So every knife is perfectly the same. Okay. And this one is 70%. So one gets 70% and one gets the next to it gets 130%. And what's happening there is at zero, I can hit all that perfectly, right? In theory. They're all getting the same amount at least. And at 70, the row to row variability, I'm wasting some. 30% on this one and this one's short. The yield response curve of corn is non symmetrical. And the value of nitrogen is only 40 cents a pound. And if I waste more, it's going to cost me 40%. But as you think about what's happening on the other side, it's, my curve is getting flatter and flatter, right? The first pound of nitrogen gets me two bushels of corn. The next pound of nitrogen gets me a bushel of corn. The next part of nitrogen gets me half a bushel. So the curve there is flat enough that even though I'm putting this row closer to where I want it, I don't get enough corn back to pay for it. And that's really how the maximum return to nitrogen works to start with, right? If you go all the way back to the tool that Iowa State recommends, the weight we want you to pick you just make that next bushel of corn to pay for yourself. In the case of knife-to-knife -knife variability, it gets harder because this one, I should pay for it. But I've wasted double that on the next one, 80 cents, and I didn't get 80 cents of yield back. Did that help? But I agree with you. When I first looked at that, I thought the same thing. That can't be true. What's my math error? Where did my model get this wrong? It's really that even though this row does a little better, I'm still not making enough corn to pay for what I wasted on the next row. Yes, yep, and you're leaching it, right? It's making my leaching 
loss is worse faster than it's making me that next bushel of corn is what's happening. Okay. I have to think about it. A I have to think about it a little more too because I finished that about two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. I trust that it's right. Is is the important part at this point? I trust that I get the right number, but it is a tough one. It's it's really that you're leaching more from this row faster than you're gaining that bushel of corn. Yeah, I put the manifolds on different slopes because, you know, you put them on different slopes. And the truth is, none of the manifolds that we tested, the slope impacted how uniform they were. But that was the slope of the toolbar. So it was horizontal, 3%, 6%. It didn't impact it, it, didn't impact it but I do have one caveat add on that. 6% is a decent slope, but that also meant that the end of my outlet wasn't above my manifold. When you go out on your big slopes or you get bigger applicators than I was willing to test, it doesn't work that way anymore, right? As soon as there's an outlet above that manifold, it doesn't flow uphill. Crap really does flow downhill. <laughs> so that, that does happen in practice because we did do a test where we had a wing above our manifold and they got zero all the time. But I tested short toolbars. Yes, the, low one, the lowest one gets the increase that the top ones didn't get. So it is try and drive flat if you can, but it turns out your fields don't help us with that. Especially when I tell you I want you to drive the contour instead of up and down the hill, right? And I have conflicting answers there and I haven't thought that through either. But you're right. We tended to test six or eight row manifolds because I had to have students moving the hoses in and out at the same time. And I didn't want to hire 20 students just for testing one 20 outlet manifold. We did test one that had 18. Uh, it tended to work reasonably well for us at that time, but the end of it did not get above the outlet. And I think we've seen some companies respond to that by going to multiple outlets on a single manure applicator. So multiple distributors to handle that problem of manifold. this one's above, yeah. Manifold. Manifolds, yeah. 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 Multiple manifolds because if it really is above the, the main manifold, you are in trouble. Good questions. All right, great to see everyone. Hope you enjoyed Swine Day. I saw there were still cookies on the second floor, so.